morning, everybody. As you're getting seated, I'm just going to briefly introduce the program. My name is Joan Hemingway. I teach at the University of Tennessee College of Law, and I'm going to be the first presenter on the panel this morning. Um, I'll be followed by Mike Warrenoff, uh, who teaches at UCLA and also practices law at Pascal Rose, so uh, comes from a joint background currently. And then last uh, but not least, we'll hear from Lyman Johnson from Washington and Lee. Uh, and the ordering basically reflects the fact that my presentation and Michael's are a little bit more specific. And then hopefully, we're, we don't, he doesn't know what we're going to say really yet, but uh, Lyman's presentation will be able to use maybe some from ours as examples. Um, I've specifically chosen in the, the 15 to 20 minutes of fame that I have to not use PowerPoint today, although I created slides for my own use. So if I look down, I hope you'll forgive me for... Um, for using my notes. I'm going to be talking this morning about corporate finance as an advanced contract drafting class. Um, I view corporate finance, and for those of you who teach it, you can feel free to differ with everything that I'm saying today, and I will welcome your comments. But I teach uh, corporate finance as a non-doctrinal class. I teach doctrine in the course, don't get me wrong. Um, but really, for me, it's an applied class, which is why I teach it as a planning and drafting class. And my presentation today will focus on two things. I really want to get to my specific example, which is what is uh, set out most fully in the materials that I gave you, which is a very, very rough initial draft. Um, but I also want to talk about my course as a foundation. I don't know how many of you in the audience actually teach corporate finance, so some of it may be um, very basic for you, but I want to spend just a few minutes talking about uh, the pedagogy, et cetera, involved in the course. My course is limited to 20 students, and uh, the prerequisite for the course is business associations. Also, it is very helpful if, as a pre- or co-requisite, the students in my class have contract drafting, which is a course that we offer every semester in multiple sections at UT. My objective in the course, and here I'm actually just going to read to you um, from my course syllabus, which is on the disc, but I want you to see how it's sort of grown and blossomed into, I hope, a flower. Um, as opposed to a shrub after 10 years of teaching the course. Uh, this is what I tell my students the course objective is. In this course, students are exposed to law, regulation, transaction documents, and practice skills impacting the formation, utilization, and investment of capital in business enterprises. The course is designed to prepare students to act as creative advisors, decision makers, and legal drafts persons in one or more areas of corporate finance practice. And then I list a few in a parenthetical. As a result, in many class exercises and interactions, we model a law office or department in which class members collaborate as co-counsel to achieve results for a client. Both written and oral expression is explored and evaluated. Okay, so that's the basics. Now how does that um, play itself out? Well, first of all, in terms of coverage, I split the class into two sections. I cover instruments, first and foremost, and these are basic instruments of corporate finance. I am not trying here to teach people how to draft a complicated swap document. That's not the point. Um, so the instruments that I cover are debt instruments, preferred stock, and convertibles, exchangeables, and options as sort of my derivatives unit, if you will. And once I get done covering the basics of those different forms of instrument, I move on to transactions. I cover dividends and repurchases, mergers and acquisitions, offerings, a whole bunch of different examples where those instruments may be used or are affected. Okay? And then uh, I also have a sloppy back end of the course that doesn't really fit into those two models that covers different topics from year to year. So for example, this past fall, I covered public investment in private enterprise. We talked about um, uh, regulation by deal, covering David Zaring's uh, and, uh, and uh, Steve Davidoff's article, um, which was published in the Administrative Law Review as a whole class session. We also review a transcript script of my expert testimony in a corporate finance case for Health South a few years ago, and I asked the students to critique certain things about that as our last class, which is sort of a packaging mechanism for some of the themes in the course. What are my teaching philosophy and goals in teaching this material? Well, um, I teach from my personal strength. For those of you who don't know me, who haven't read my bio, which actually turns out to be extraordinarily long, I told them to edit it, but they didn't. Um, 
is uh, that I practiced in the corporate finance area, mergers and acquisitions and securities regulation for 15 years at Skadden Arps Boston office. So that frames also my view on the course and my teaching of the course. Um, and I've tried in the course to teach, to link really theory and policy on the one end of a spectrum to practice through doctrine. So I try to take the students through everything. The theory part of the course is admittedly uh, the smallest part of the course. I'm hopeful uh, that they're getting some theory in other classes and for the JD MBAs in the class, they're actually getting finance theory across the street. I'm teaching legal aspects of corporate finance, not actually finance theory in this class. Uh, I also teach the synthesis of doctrine here. Some of the cases, as those of you who teach the course know, don't just involve business associations, law and contract drafting principles, but they might involve tax or real estate law. And so we get to talk about things like original issue discounts that they might not see in other classes in a context. Um, and that's part of what I mean by this is not really a doctrinal class. It's more a fusion of doctrines, if you will. And then, of course, I'm teaching transactional skills at the other end of the spectrum. Uh, planning and drafting is actually a JD degree requirement at the University of Tennessee College of Law. You must take at least one planning and drafting class, and this class satisfies that requirement. So does our more general contract drafting class, which is why that is so popular. Uh, I also try in the class to reinforce sound legal reasoning. You'll see how I do that through the technique I'm going to be sharing with you today. Um, and uh, I try to teach speaking the law as well as writing the law in the class and evaluate students on that basis. In fact, one of my objectives in each year, I have to engage with it when I do my syllabus, when I do my materials, when I construct my class notes, is trying to teach more and more transparently. I am not a hide the ball Socratic method teacher in this class. Okay? Instead, I tell the students in each of the assignments what they're supposed to do and on what basis they will be evaluated. And my grading sheets for each of the assignments in the class actually use the bullet points from what I've told them they're going to be evaluated on as the evaluative criteria, and I assign weights to them in each individual year. So the students know what they're being graded on uh, and what they're being asked to do, I hope. But I refine it every year. I had a, um, a brief conversation yesterday with Lyman on the course, so I added a couple of uh, notes in my presentation uh, for Lyman and for those of you in the audience um, because he is very engaged with pedagogy. I use multiple teaching methods in this class and we'll only be discussing some of them today, but I'm delighted to engage with some of you outside the classroom on the remainder. I do do some lecture, I think it's important. I do do some normal Q&A, again not Socratic, but normal question and answer to test the student's understanding of the reading in particular. I use the problem method. I use a panel of experts. Uh, we'll see in a minute that one of my assessment tools is to ask two student teams to teach a class during the course of the semester under my guidance. Um, small expert group work where they work together, as I indicated in my course objective, as co-counsel, including uh, drafting a debt redemption notice in group format. And I have two teams in the class that compete with each other to see how much detail they can catch by using a precedent transaction document to draft that redemption notice. Um, I do peer review in the course, including by the third assignment that actually reviews the assignment I'm going to talk to you about today, role playing, uh, and guest lectures. So that's a large least list of teaching methodologies. I'm glad Lyman actually asked me to think about that. My guest lectures, by the way, are on bankruptcy, reorgs, and restructuring uh, type transactions. And then separate and apart from that, we do a one-day unit on municipal finance because uh, that's not taught in any other course at the UT College of Law, which is a very small uh, law school. This allows me to engage with my students on multiple different bases, okay? Uh, <coughs> through reading that we all do collectively together, through listening, okay? And through doing, um, specifically planning and drafting are the core element of the course. And the drafting, by the way, some of it's done on the web, some of it's done in class, some of it's done in hard copy uh, type format. <coughs> Teaching materials, I use a non-traditional law text, the McDermott textbook. Uh, don't, no offense meant, if, uh, if anyone knows him, I have a lot of quibbles with the book, <coughs> but I like using the materials as a jumping off point for my work. Uh, so there are cases in the book, there are New York Stock Exchange rules in the book, although I teach my students to look for those on the web for the current versions. 
Uh, I give them book excerpts, law review, article excerpts, a whole bunch of different things. Um, and I also give them a one-day tutorial on legal research uh, that is electronic in focus. Uh, there's a tutorial they have to listen to before class from one of our law librarians on web-based research. And then I take them through some exercises and give them actually a handout on how to find precedent transaction documents using Lexis and using Westlaw, uh, specifically the Edgar databases there that are much more um, granularly searchable than they are through the SEC's website. Uh, I also give them form documents and practice tools. And obviously for that last class where they're reviewing my, um, my expert proceedings, they have to actually engage with uh, a, a transcript of legal proceedings. So how do I assess students in this class? Uh, class participation is actually 15% uh, of their grade. That includes their class expert experience as a teacher. Uh, that includes also in-class exercises. Uh, with 20 students, I can really tell who's there and who's not. Um, so it's easier for me to do that. Each year, I set up components of that 15% in different ways. I also give them a disclosure drafting assignment, which is prospectus disclosure for some aspect of preferred stock. It varies uh, from time to time. I, I flip back and forth. But for example, they've had to describe anti-dilution provisions and uh, convertible preferred stock instrument for one of the assignments and also redemption provisions. Those are my two favorites. Um, uh, they also do a substantial written project. That's what we're going to be talking about here this morning in my uh, last 10 minutes or so. Uh, and that is uh, specifically a draft provision for some instrument in corporate finance, maybe a, a piece of preferred stock, a voting provision for preferred stock, um, or a debt redemption provision or something to that effect, usually only of about a page in length. Okay, But they give it to me with a memorandum that explains their drafting choices. And that is the core for me. That's the key on that assignment. That's worth 45% uh, of the grade. By the way, the disclosure assignment is 20% of their grade. And then their review memorandum, uh, which reviews someone else's substantial written project, there's part of the peer review in the course, is actually the last 20% of their grade. Okay, So that's the course in basic format. So Tina actually referred to my uh, framework that I use in this course that is most clearly seen, I think, through the substantial written project. Uh, and that is that I use IRAC as a drafting tool. This pervades the course, so I'm only going to talk about one aspect of it today, in and outside the classroom. Um, and it's only one tool to be used, so I'm sort of being very selective and narrow <coughs> in what I'm presenting to you today. I wouldn't suggest that the whole course involves this exclusively. It does involve this, but along with other things. It enables me to use cases in a new way, okay, to support drafting. Uh, I ask students to actually find what the drafting issue is in the cases that McDermott presents in the casebook. Sometimes that's the same as the issue that leads to a holding in a normal IRAC type analysis. <coughs> Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's significantly narrower or it's only a piece of the case that we're reading. Um, and so I ask them to, to ask themselves the following question. If the plaintiff wanted X, and that's your drafting issue, okay, the plaintiff should have Y, okay? And that's going to be your conclusion, okay, in the IRAC analysis. So what rules do I tell them to use if once we've identified the issue? Well, it's a, it's a huge panoply of rules in a class like corporate finance that you would use to answer those questions. And by the way, Tina's framework also answers some of these questions. So it's nice, I think, to have both and to use them to operate in parallel, okay? Um, you're going to look for legal rules if there actually are statutes or cases that expressly cover the point that is your issue in that issue sentence you're obviously going to use those. You need to know the applicable law in order to do that. There may also be stock exchange or other securities market rules that apply. So I ask the students to look for those. Okay? You may need the dictionary. We'll come back to that in a minute, the example that I'm going to give you this morning of a potential student project. You may need to use drafting principles. You may need to use norms. You may want to look at, for example, what other agreements do, what's customary in practice. So you're not drafting out in the relative hinterlands, okay? So that everybody's going to look at your draft and say, what is this? No idea what that is. And then, of course, there's theory and policy, especially for the larger contract questions that you're going to use, rules derived from uh, theory and policy as well. Uh, the analysis part takes, of course, 
the, uh, the rules that you have and applies them to the client's facts. So we do do, and it is simulated in the class, obviously we do the discovery of client facts in connection with the projects that we do, including the one that they select, uh, which is attached, by the way, to the back of my handouts for today. And then, of course, the conclusion is the drafting choice that they make to answer the issue, okay? So you can see, it's not exactly uh, your mother's IRAC, right? It's a little different, but it's reinforcing that same set of processes that you go through to answer other legal questions. Drafting is a legal question on some basis, and since I'm teaching the legal aspects of corporate finance, I focus on that. Um, so how does this substantial written project work? Um, well, again, a lot of it is in the materials that I gave you, but just to highlight, it's due at, well not quite at, near the end of the semester, within the last two weeks or so of the semester. It's principally a summative form of assessment because of its placement in the semester. But my comments are formative. They're meant to propel the students into either another course, if they're second year students, or if they have a semester left as third year students, depending on which semester I'm teaching the course in. Um, but, uh, but really what I'm doing is using this as a principal grading device to see if they got the stuff that I was trying to teach them in the course. They pick the project, okay? They can pick whatever they want, but they have to file a written proposal with me. And I also have my request for proposals included in the materials uh, for you today, okay? They actually have to send me something in advance. That becomes a great formative tool, too, because we sit down and discuss their understanding of the project within the first three weeks of the semester. So if they're picking something we're not going to get to late until later, we have to start engaging with that, and I tell them what to look out for along the way as we're going along, okay? So I can see what their understanding is basically of the first few weeks of corporate finance at that particular point in time. Um, this project is also a component of leveraged learning, though. That's just my term, okay? Uh, and this is really the formative piece. When they go back and they review another student's project as a mid-level associate, they move from the junior associate drafting role to the mid-level associate review role uh, in the course of these two, these last two assignments. They are basically taking what they learn in doing their analyses of the contract provisions. And I assign them, by the way, a totally different type of instrument to review. So if one person's doing debt redemption, they might be reviewing like a, uh, uh, an anti-dilution provision in preferred stock. Ideally, they would be doing something like that, or voting provisions <coughs> in preferred stock. But they're employing that same analysis and doing it in a new area, and having just done it in a similar type of, of transaction, they hopefully can leverage the learning from their substantial written project to do the review project. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's really a very, I think, you know, in a funny sense, elegant way to reinforce the reasoning one more time while at the same time using the learning that they've done on their projects. Um, and part of my evaluative tool is evaluating exactly how they use IRAC. Okay, so brief, simple example, because I want you to have time for questions in the end. Um, suppose the issue that a student wants to address in their project is whether, and if so, how, uh, a conversion provision should adjust for a spin-off, and their instrument is a senior debt indenture. Okay, so that's what they're trying to resolve, okay? It's one issue in drafting the conversion <coughs> provisions that they're drafting. So what rules might they choose to apply? Well, um, the first thing I always ask everybody to do is look for predicate authority. Authority for the parties to engage in this specific transaction as part of a larger deal, uh, which they also must have authority for. Okay, so transactional authority and party authority. Um, but one of the first questions you have to answer is, what's a spin-off, right? Not codified anywhere in the law. Courts are a little squirrely about it. Actually, they come out on some of these issues in different ways. So a lot of courts look at the dictionary or look at a finance dictionary or probably now look at Wikipedia. I haven't found that yet, right? But I'm sure some court is going to do that at some point or another or the uh, or Investopedia, you know, the... Uh, the analog for those of us in finance. Um, so they have to look at, at, at that kind of a definitional rule to figure out what it is, and they might find that it's a form of dividend, right? Ooh, so maybe the word dividend is enough, okay? Maybe if we include that, that's enough. They have to also look at contract construction and interpretation rules, right? Expressio unius, es exclusio alterius, right? We don't include it, we might not mean for it to be there, 
That ha that's a factor in a lot of the cases, right? Drafting norms. What do typical provisions look like? Do they call out a spinoff separately? Do they define what it is? Do I need a defined term to deal with this? Academic and practice commentary, also very relevant. And of course, decisional law, since there are a number of cases in the area. I expect them to mine those cases and look for ones in the jurisdiction in which, uh, which is governing their particular contract. Um, application and analysis. They need to know who the parties are. They need to know um, where they're organized in order to know where the applicable was uh, or where they're resident, if it's an individual. Um, they need to understand what the objectives of the parties are. You know, why are they worried about this? Are they worried about this? You know, what's important about this? And then, of course, their conclusion, usually in a project like this, would be that they need to include an express, unambiguous, spin-off term, defined or undefined, rather than relying on just the term dividend, if that's one of the conclusions they came to earlier in the project, in their list of anti-dilution provisions in that conversion provision, okay? Uh, so that's just, again, a very brief example. Um, I'm going to turn the program over to Lyman, but I want to welcome your comments on the very rough draft that I've attached um, and, uh, and also my presentation at the end. So, oh, not Lyman, sorry. <laughs> I've never used, I just came, the, the last presentation was on the evils of PowerPoint. I've never used a PowerPoint before. I'm a Blackboard guy, so yeah, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to mess this up. Uh, so forgive me. <coughs> um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, teaching numeracy, and uh, I, I was just going to get into it, but when I was having breakfast, someone thought I had misspelled the word and meant numerosity. I, I mean numeracy, <laughs> <laughs> which, which is which is the equivalent of literacy, right? So we're talking about uh, 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 an ability to reason with numbers and, um, and other mathematical concepts. And, uh, and uh, I think that um, it's an area that obviously gets a, a short shrift in, in law school. So I want to talk a little bit about why it's important and how you can go about teaching it. Um, and um, before we start, we're just a test. I'm going to show you a, an, an actual, I, I also, um, uh, taught an undergraduate math class. This is an actual answer. If you get this, you enumerate it. If you, you, you don't have to think it's funny, but if you get it, you're not. <laughs> so um, I actually got that as an answer. <laughs> I, was, and I, noticed, I gave partial credit. To this. <laughs> so um, so here, here are the issues in, in, uh, in uh, I see. It took me 15 minutes to turn the page after so, um, so here are the issues, right? Um, a lot of people who go to law school, they don't want to learn uh, mathematical concepts. Uh, they're, they're, they they uh, majored in, in um, uh, liberal arts or English or poli-sci and, and didn't, you know, never had to, to uh, I'm not saying everyone, but I think a, a, a large portion of the, of the of students who go in. Uh, and, and as a matter of fact, skill levels uh, differ dramatically. I was an engineering major when I went to law school, and I was sitting in, in classes with English majors. So, so you have the problem as a as a teacher of going in and saying, well, do I bore these people, or do I go way above the heads of, of these people? And the last is there's a lot of professors, no one in this room, but as you go out into the academy, you'll know that there's a lot of people who are uncomfortable, uh, uncomfortable with with the concept. So maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe maybe they're right, and, and the way that's done is, is right, and, and numeracy is not that important for lawyers. Um, uh, and you know maybe the, maybe the, there's something to the fact that lawyers are math phobic, and it doesn't it doesn't matter. Uh, and I, I put up a couple quotes, but you can find dozens and dozens and dozens of quotes. Just uh, uh, two two stories. That when I was here two years ago, uh, I, I, I teach a course in venture capital. And uh, and uh, and I spent a lot of time working on um, uh, conversion and anti-dilution, uh, and in fact, the example we'll use in a little bit will be on that. And I, I was talking to someone else who taught a venture capital course, and I was asking because I, I I always am curious about how you get get across these concepts. And I said, how do you teach this? And he said, oh, I skip it. My students aren't smart enough to get that. And I'm thinking, well, when they go out and practice, they're going to have to get it. And yet, and yet you don't think they're smart enough when they're in the classroom. If they're not going to learn in the classroom, where are they going to learn? 
Um, I, I wrote an article on, on anti-dilution uh, provisions uh, in, for Fordham, and I, I wrote a simplified version for it for uh, business, uh, business lawyer, the monthly, mag semi-monthly, whatever it is, uh, bi-monthly magazine of the ABA. And they rejected it, uh, not because they said this is very good, but uh, if our readers uh, wanted to do math, they never would have become lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, so, but here are the things. I mean, you know, I, I just sat down and started thinking about how do transactional lawyers use uh, numeracy. And you can, you can, I'm sure you can come up with, this, this took me 10 minutes. Uh, I don't want to tell you how long it took me to prepare the whole thing, but uh, it's only 15. But, but I mean, there are all these areas, whether it's in venture capital or finance or mergers and acquisitions. I mean, everything. Uh, you, you need to, you know, tax, you, you, you need family law, as someone was, as at breakfast, someone was using all these family law examples. You need to know, and yet we're afraid to teach you. <clears throat> so, um, uh, and in fact, if you look at, you know, this is, this is the, uh, you, know, you have this uh, Madoff scandal in the SEC, the, the SEC lawyers were, they just couldn't comprehend it, right? These are people who are going into the SEC looking at, uh, at financial matters, and they, they don't have the, the conception, because they were never taught. So how do you how do you teach it given all the problems that we have? Well, first of all, you set expectations. If you I, I have in, in the handout, you'll see my my um, uh, what goes in the course book when they're they're choosing students who are looking at the courses at UCLA, and I put in there you're assumed to have uh, you know we use algebra. You, you don't want to you you don't want to take the course. It's okay, but we're using algebra, and you're assumed to have competency in. Um, you have to introduce it incrementally, and I'll I'll go through what I do over a semester. I don't know. I won't do everything in here, but I'll, I'll sort of show you how I progress. You start out small, and you just keep building on it, right? Um, and then I would say don't un underestimate, underestimate your students. My, my experience has been that the more you challenge the students, the more they're up to the challenge. And, and I've been able to teach really, really sophisticated uh, mathematical concepts to people who have no, you know, basically high school level uh, uh, math competence. Um, the other thing I would say, uh, which I didn't, uh, I didn't put in here, but is um, I think it's got to be inherent in, in the materials that you're teaching. So I teach a venture capital course, and there's lots of opportunities during the course where math is important, anti-dilution, 83B elections, and I'm teaching those things, and the math is important to it. You know, pe people who, who know me know that I, I would not, and, and by the way, it takes, you'll see, I'm just going to do one little piece, I'm going to show you something of, that I do over the course of the semester that happens in three classrooms takes up a lot of time. I do not think you should, for example, take the basic business organizations course and just shove a bunch of math into it because I think that all those concepts are really important. I think this is an additional to that, not in place of that. And I think that, that yeah, I, I think if it's in that course, if you happen to be discussing something in, in biz orgs or securities where, where math is coming up, you should do it, but it should be inherent in the thing and not replace what you would otherwise be, what we would otherwise teach. <clears throat> so we'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about valuation and anti-dilution. Um, if you look in the very back of the handout, um, these charts will be there not filled in except for the information that's given. They also, interestingly enough, instead of putting the PowerPoint on the computer, put the PowerPoint in there so you also have the charts filled in. Uh, but don't, don't look at the, at the chart, <coughs> look, look, the PowerPoint charts, look at the, the other thing in the very back. When I first started, so I've been teaching venture capital around 10 years, and, um, and when I first started, I would try, I, I, I wanted to get, you know, pre and post money valuation is very important in venture capital, and I would try to teach formulas. And, you know, these are the formulas, there's five of them, there's, there's probably, there's more, and I would try to have the students remember these formulas. And it was very difficult to get them to remember the formulas, you know, uh, uh, pre money value is, is um, uh, you know, it's, it, it, again, post money value and, and the shares issue and all those things, it, it, they were difficult to get across it. So, in, in about the third year or so, I said, there's got to be a better way to do this. And I came up with, uh, with a, uh, what, I, what, what I call the magic table in class. They get a big kick out of that. So, I came up with a table that incorporates the formulas. So, they don't have to learn the formulas anymore. Right? So if you look at, at post money value, you know the pre money value plus amount raised is post money value. So all you have to do is add down the column. If they can remember the table, which is very simple, and they can remember that all you have to do is add down, 
then, then, then they've remembered the formula without having to remember the formula, right? If they can remember that you, that you take shares times a value and, and you can get, uh, uh, it, it, you can take, uh, excuse me, shares times the per share price, you can get an implied value. So they can, they can see that they can, by using the table, they're able to, um, uh, they're able to learn the formulas without learning the formulas. So, does this work? There you go. So, um, what happens is there, there are case, I, use, I use Harvard Business School cases. <clears throat> and the very first case on the very first day is a case about uh, choosing a lawyer, choosing an accountant, and basically uh, getting some angel financing. And it provides a very simple example of, of trying to figure out valuation. And they give three pieces of information in the case. Which is that uh, the, the company's raising a million dollars? Yeah, so the company's raising a million dollars. It's fifty cents a share. There's four. There's four million shares outstanding beforehand, right? So they give you three pieces of information, and you fill in the table. And, and of course, uh, and, and of course, uh, percentages always have to add up to hundred. So that box is it's like the center in bingo. That that box is always hundred <laughs> percent. So um, so uh, with this information. Uh, we're able to. We're able, I'm able to. I'm able to start with them very simply to say, well, look, if you know, um, if you know that it's 50 cents a share, and you know that they're raising a million dollars, then we know there's two million shares, right? And so, so we can do that. Then we know that if you have four million shares and 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 they're issuing two, you know that the total outstanding afterwards is going to be six, right? All the formulas are here, but it's very simple when when they look at it. They don't have to remember those anymore. I, I can't tell you how dramatic this, the change was. And you're able to go through, then you know, if you know it's 50 cents a share, you know at, uh, you know, four million shares is worth two million, you know the total of six million. You can get this three million either way, right? So they start figuring out the, the relationships. You can either get it by doing the 50 cents gets you to the three million, or you can add two and one is three million. This is the beauty of the table. There's many ways to get all the numbers. They remember all the forms. And then the percentages, of course, are easy to do, right? And so they fill that in. That's the first class. When we're done doing that, half the class are eyes are glazed over. <laughs> they have no idea. And I, prom I say, don't worry about it. It's okay, because we do it, and we're going to do it over and over and over and over again in the class. And so half the class starts getting it right away, and the other half, they're, we're, they're just going to have to, they're just going to have to trust me that by the end, they'll get it. <clears throat> so how do we... Uh, so why is it moving forward? There we go. Um, uh, so then, uh, then uh, there's a CAD solar. I also use the Bagley and Dowchy text. They have a term sheet for a venture capital deal in there. Uh, this is the um, uh, this is the term sheet that they do, uh, and they give this information, right? And so they give you actually more information, and we're able to then write. So you can see things like if I know that we're raising 660. If we're issuing 666,000 shares, and the total is 1,666, you can get, you know, right, the top plus the middle has to equal the bottom. And then you can take the implied value and get those values, right? So this was just the same thing over again, just in a different example. Now, the thing about this is, what happens is, after we do that, they realize that there's, there's other, then you start making it a little more complex, right? Well, pre-money valuation isn't really just pre-money valuation. There's a founder and there's an option, <coughs> right? And so what happens is you're able to fill in all this from that previous page, and you're able to start talking to them about, about how you fill in the rest of that, right? And so we know that, we know that again, the top plus the middle has to equal the pre-money valuation. Right, and uh, and so we're able to there, and and the one extra piece of data that they've, they've been given is that the option pool is going to be twenty percent, right? And so you know, for example, you know that if uh, uh, if you know a million is sixty percent, you know a third of a million is is twenty percent, and you can fill in all the rest of the data the same way. So see, you started with really simple. You you we had we had the simple. We repeated it, and then we just add it, right? It's all incremental. Um, so then I go down. So now you have now you have pre and post money valuation down, 
Right? And like I said, I'm doing this much quicker here because I only have 20 minutes now a semester. And I use multiple. Although <laughs> Mantina give me more time than everyone. Yeah. So, um, so. Uh, you can you on time in the next book? And so, yes. So, um, so then, once you have valuations down, you can then start talking about down round financings and how to do uh, uh, anti dilution uh, problems. So, um, this is a problem. Now, the down round financing I do, I give them my own uh, data. We fill this in. They can write by now. Now, even the people in the beginning whose eyes were blazing over this table, it's easy for them to do. And then, boom, they fill it out. Right? They just do it because it's just they've seen it over and over again. And they're, they, now they're, they're very happy because they, they know that they've learned something. So we'll go and we'll do, we'll do this table. Uh, and, then, and then I do uh, three things. I do what happens if you did the <coughs> issuance and there was no anti-dilution protection? What happens if there's an issuance and it's full ratchet? And what happens if there's an issuance and there's, anti and there's uh, weighted average? <coughs> and so um, the information we know from the previous table is um, we know uh, uh, we, we know that the excuse me the information I give them is that in the in the down round the pre money valuation is going to be three million dollars uh, and it's going to be fifty percent of the company. The information we know from the previous table is right since it's full ratchet that eight million shares doesn't change right and I make them think about how do you get that information what so that we've taught them all about what full ratchet is what weighted average is. And I say, okay, what would change, what wouldn't change? The things we know that don't change in full ratchet is the number of shares the founder has, that doesn't change because they don't get adjusted. And we know that the value that the Series A investor had doesn't change, right? That's the beauty of full ratchet. You keep the value of your security. <coughs> and so they're able to, they know those two things. Well, then it's just simple. The tables, even though it's a new concept, it's simple, it's the same table. And you can start, right, if we know, for example, we know pre-money is 50%, then we know the amount raised has to be 50%. So we know this will be three million, that'll be, and the total will be six, right? <coughs> and they can just start filling in the table the same way. You can go through, uh, you can go through and figure out what all the values are. Uh, and you can go through and figure out, <coughs> figure out what all the values are. And by this time, they all, they all get it. So um, uh, uh, I knew I was supposed to write a concluding slide. I forgot. I ran. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, anyway, so uh, if if you want more detail, the, the like I said, the slides, the, the charts are in here. But if you want more detail on the lessons or anything, uh, happy to talk about it. I'm going to sit because I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I don't want my notes to spill all over the podium. Okay. The topic I'm going to talk about is two techniques to link in-depth learning and drafting. But before I turn to the two techniques, I want to situate my comments into some currents in legal education, just very briefly. As we all know, there's a great deal of healthy ferment in legal education these days. And there are many factors for that. Certainly the Carnegie Foundation report of 2007, the recent <coughs> upheaval in the job market for young lawyers, and changes in the delivery of legal services more generally. But these changes were brewing even though they may not have openly surfaced for some time. And one long-standing concern for those of us interested in education reform and legal education has been the overall singularity of the model of legal education in the United States. Now I think with some useful turbulence in legal education, a greater pluralism of approaches is emerging. Some approaches are wholesale. For example, what we at WNL did with the third year, we completely revised it. Students will take no traditional courses during their third year. They will take practicum, externships and clinical experiences. Other approaches are more incremental. Program by program, course by course, perhaps professor by professor. And one common, though not universal, theme has been a dramatic upsurge in pedagogy with a more practical, experiential, and lawyerly bent. 
At WNL, we call these practicums, and there's many features of these, and, and Joan's remarks captured a lot of them. I just want to highlight three very briefly. Greater student responsibility for organizing and producing the work. If we could use a baseball metaphor, the teacher is no longer a pitcher handling the ball on every play, but has been moved out as a sort of lonesome right fielder, observing, participating occasionally, but really not the center of the action. Second, law is not learned as a standalone endeavor, but it's learned in aid of actually solving problems. And third, rather than simply acquire knowledge and information, however important that will be over their entire careers, students have to exercise informed judgment. They must offer views and advice. So rather than simply take in, they have to produce. I think the transactional lawyering movement is really a part of this larger current in legal education. And having taught a business planning practicum for over 20 years, and having been through major curricular reform, and that's not always a pretty process to be involved in, as we all know. <clears throat> and this reform that I've been involved in has sought a more practice-oriented thrust. I want to highlight one over overarching point that I think Mike's and Jones, as well as Ron's and George's comments this morning, really drove home. I think it's imperative for those interested in transactional pedagogy practical pedagogy more generally, to pervasively emphasize the intellectually demanding nature of this work. Among true believers gathered here, this is not news, but I have repeatedly seen in legal education the number of skeptics who vaguely suspect that this is not intellectually legitimate who really wonder whether practical education is intellectually demanding enough. Now, of course it is. But I think we need to be aware that there are people who do not necessarily share our views. So I just want to touch on three places where this needs to be communicated. It needs to be communicated in your home schools. And my home school is very receptive to this, but there remain skeptics. Second, I think among our peers in legal education generally. And I think as you move up the elitist scale, some of the skepticism may be more deeply entrenched. I was very disappointed, for example, to read Brian Leiter's description of our three L reforms. I thought he didn't understand them at all. And after some ongoing conversation, I think he became more receptive. But I don't think he really, really understood or was open to them at all. But third, I think we have to communicate it to our own transactional lawyering students. And I want to talk about that today. I think a transactional lawyering class doesn't have to be, but it can be very intellectually challenging. So with that backdrop, let me, let me hone in a little bit. Now first, let me explain a little bit about my class and a little bit about <coughs> Washington and Lee, because I'm not sure how easily uh, this translates. Washington and Lee is a very small law school. It has 130 students in each class. It is also located in a very small community, Lexington, Virginia, with 7,000 people. That means there's not a lot to distract our law students. There's <laughs> just nothing to do. Their social life, as well as their educational life, is in the law school. So it's a classic captive audience. My business planning course uh, traditionally ran around 20 to 25 students. We have now capped it at 15 as we go into this pervasive change. It's a five credit class, so it's heavily credited. Relatively few sessions are in the classroom, about a third. Most of them are meeting with me or working in groups. I use Frank Gewurz's book, but I think I use it the way you use McDermott's book. I like the problems, even though I end up changing the problems quite a bit, and there's background material. My students do drafting, a fair bit of it. And I think a well-drawn dispositive document certainly requires skill in drafting. And there are commonalities to drafting skill. At the same time, I think students have to understand and be able to explain why certain substantive choices are being made in the document. 
In short, I think the best drafting requires understanding as well as skill. Two techniques are certainly others, but let me explain a couple. First, requiring that a companion analytical memo accompany the drafting product. This memo explains what was done in the document <coughs> and why. The drafted document itself takes care of the how. How are you going to put this together? How are you going to draft your anti-dilution provisions? Or how are you going to draft what Jones talked about? But the analytical memo says, why did you do what you did? Explain it. Second, in office meetings. These are just what they sound like. But the purpose is to guide students as well as deepen their understanding of the material. So let me start with meetings. I do several face-to-face, in-office meetings in groups of two or three. In the jargon of learning theory, these are synchronous interactions, not asynchronous. That's just a fancy way for talking about we're all participating at the same time. Another example is IM, or video conferencing. These communications are taking place in real time and everybody is a participant. As opposed to asynchronous email, there can be a delay. Some of my colleagues prefer the latter. They prefer asynchronous interactions. They think you get more thoughtful, more reflective, better interactions. I think both work. I think it just depends on what your goals are. An example is in the material for meetings. Uh, I'll refer to it briefly. I give them an assignment uh, early on, and you will see that the first paragraph tells them, you must schedule meetings with me. These are mandatory meetings. Now, I should mention as an aside, when they first get this assignment, it's sort of reminiscent of when Winston Churchill in World War II was trying to figure out how to deal with German subs, and he was trying to figure out how do we get them to come to the surface. So he turned to an aide and he said, boil the ocean. <laughs> and the aide said, how? Churchill said, I come up with the concepts, you take care of the details. <laughs> so they get this and they think, wow, uh, put together an LLC or a partnership and tell you why we did what we did. Well, there's a lot of us. But we sort of work through this together. So, But the first requirement is you must meet for me. Now I start these initial meetings with a series of very open-ended questions, and you can pick your own, but some examples. What have you done so far? Now this requires them to succinctly summarize and describe to somebody what they've done. Second, what problems have you encountered? Here they have to self-reflect and assess. Gee, what has been difficult over the last couple of days? Third, what are you planning to do next? Now they see that they have to think forward. They need to actually plan discharging this responsibility. And fourth, because this is group work, how is your group dividing and coordinating work? Are you working efficiently? Do you have a control freak? Do you have a free rider? Explain to me exactly how this is happening. Now, all of these naturally invite a lot of follow-up questions. If a student does not address a particular issue, you can hone in and, and pose very pointed questions. For example, uh, the first problem is a startup venture with expected losses. Right. What are you doing about taking advantage tax-wise of these losses? Sometimes they haven't even thought about it. Do you want to try to take advantage of these losses or simply leave them in entity solution where they may be wasted if the business fails? The key here, I think, is that students and teachers see learning not as episodic, but as an ongoing dialogue that occasionally requires the more experienced lawyer to redirect them and deepen them a bit. Very much like tutorials or like any healthy mentor-protege relationship. Now, what are the benefits of I think there are many, but let me list a few. Studies show greater psychological arousal and motivation from synchronous interaction. When they're dealing in real time, they are more engaged, more aroused, more motivated. Second, 
It overcomes the tendency in legal education to see learning as something that happens in isolation and by yourself. <coughs> Third, it's a great opportunity for give and take. Follow-up is immediate. You can correct, extend, deepen the understanding very quickly. Fourth, you can identify omissions and oversights, things they simply never thought about. Providing immediate, ungraded feedback. <coughs> is very helpful to students. This is sort of the rage these days in assessment. Giving them immediate feedback, but I don't think all feedback has to be graded. Not only do students not learn in the same way, they also do not not learn in the same way. They fail in different ways. And the sooner you can correct that, before they actually <coughs> produce a product, the better. You can observe their responses. <coughs> Who's prepared? How are they interacting with each other? Are all of them contributing? And you can obviously hone in on a particular student if he or she is handling that. Also, I think you can communicate your commitment and you can model mentoring. Since I become a lawyer 32 years ago, I think there's been a dramatic decline in practicing lawyers, this is a generalization, not enough of them identify themselves as having a mentoring responsibility to young lawyers. My older lawyers thought it was part of their professional responsibility to teach me to be a, young, a good lawyer. I have heard many disparaging comments among experienced lawyers about that. They need to be practice ready. Well, no young lawyer is practice ready. We can help, but the teaching mission goes on in the law firm. That students need to see that we're committed to this and what it looks like. Next, this so-called e-generation for electronic generation has relatively little experience with face-to-face -face interaction. <coughs> Except for their parents and teachers, they probably have had no business experience in a meeting. My 24-year-old son, who's a business consultant in Boston, came out of a great school, was stunned to find the first week the number of meetings he was thrust into with clients, with his senior partners. And I think the e-generation has really taken a back and don't really know how to handle themselves in a face-to-face -face situation. And finally, there are great opportunities to go off the record. And you can sort of fill in their deficits in their social legal capital. Whether it's talking about job search or things they don't know, it's wonderful opportunities to transition into other subjects. Follow-up meetings, uh, generally I expect greater sophistication because they should be farther along. For example, I've got an IP issue in the first problem, and I expect them to have very detailed recommendations for how that's being taken care of. Now the second assignment, uh, the second page in, you'll notice a change. At the very end of that paragraph, I do not require meetings. I tell them to schedule meetings with me if they want them. Now, I strongly urge that they meet with me. I emphasize that I'm completely available, but I'm trying to teach them that how and when to seek help is something they need to learn. Now, having said that, I think this current cohort of law students believes that there's something wrong with asking for help. Somewhere in their earlier educational experiences, they were evaluated for asking questions. I don't know how we remedy that, but that's why I have mixed feelings about making this optional. So I try to couple it with strong exhortation. And of course, the better students, in my experience, spend more time in my office because they see how much they can learn. Let me turn to the second technique, which is the uh, companion memo. And to tie this to my overarching point, these are, these are heavily analytical, uh, demanding, and I think they're far richer in their analysis because of the in-office meetings, in which students are guided as to the range of issues they have to address and they're pushed to deepen their understanding. I simply said, go off, draft a document, and tell me what you did. I don't think I would get the quality of analysis or quality of drafting that I get because they've had some meetings with me. 
Uh, let me just go back to the first uh, page as an example. Uh, you'll see here that the first document I described is that they have to write a clear, cogent, no more than six single-spaced pages analyzing whether the startup biotech venture should be organized as a partnership or an LLC. I take corporate forms off the table. I'm going to come to that in my second problem. So this is purely unincorporated entities. You tell me which vehicle and then tell me why you came to that choice. And then in the rest of the memo, they have to address a range of issues, starting with number one. Identify key client goals and how you achieve them. What do you think the client's goals were? How did you achieve them? Second, key difficulties and how you surmounted them. <clears throat> Focusing in on very specific issues. It might be management structure, it might be exits, it might be a special allocation of losses for tax purposes, intellectual property issues. Tell me what you did. And then finally, uh, second to the last paragraph, draft the document. You can do the whole thing or the major portions of it. But I want to see a, a final document. Now the other part of this, you look in the uh, second paragraph, the last sentence. We talk about conflict of interest because most of these startup deals, unless there's one person, the lawyer may represent multiple people. In one of the sessions I was in yesterday talked about how that's a recurrent problem in a transactional practice, conflicts. Well, they're very glib at citing the code, the model rules, as to informed consent. As long as you get informed consent, you know, blah, 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 they, they, they tell us, you know, perfectly. After they do this, and they realize how many trade-offs they made or helped their clients make, they become very reluctant to represent more than one client. And, what I, and, I, and I talked to them about this, that there's nothing wrong with it, but I want you to see the rules are designed to encourage multiple clients. It's a lawyer protection rule. It get informed consent and you can represent people. And they see, by going through this experience, how challenging it is. And then most of them are very uncomfortable. If they're coming into your practice, they're, <laughs> they're, they're tainted. <laughs> now, these memos, uh, back to the analytical memos, in my experience, allow students to use a genre that they know, the expository memo, to organize and express why and what they are doing in another genre, a dispositive document with which they are very unfamiliar. So it is a pedagogical technique. I'm not suggesting that anybody in Mike's law firm uh, is going to ask for an analytical memo. But it is a bridging pedagogical teaching technique to help them transition from explaining, which they understand from first year memos, if not college. Explain what you did, explain why it, then do it. So it is decidedly a pedagogical technique. I don't suggest it's a, it's a lawyer document. I think it helps students draft. Many of them tell me they thought they would be drafting the memo first and then draft. In fact, they prepare them in parallel. Because as they're drafting, they think, what am I doing? Then they explain something. They say, well, I didn't really do that. And so it tends to be a back and forth drafting process. Now to wrap up, I certainly don't think that every drafting exercise or every drafting course must be intellectually demanding. That's not my claim. I do, however, think that in transactional lawyering courses, there are wonderful opportunities for helping students see the connection between interesting and very challenging legal subjects on the one hand and the craft of lawyering on the other. And I think, too, back to my first point, at this juncture in legal education where skeptics remain, 
And I want to underscore, I think there is a stronger body of resistance and skeptics than we might believe. Highlighting the intellectually demanding nature of this work can help overcome some of that resistance as well as help our students. your name and your affiliation and your question, I will attempt to repeat all of that into the microphone for purposes of Brenda C. from Faulkner University. Brenda, Brenda, your last name? C. C. Brenda C. Mm -hmm. From Faulkner, you said, mm -hmm. University. Um, in your program, it seems very time intensive for the professor. So how many credits do you teach in a semester in this third year, and how does it affect your time for scholarship? So yeah, how many, uh, how many um, uh, credits. credits do you teach in the semester, and uh, how does it affect the rest of the curriculum? Yeah, great questions, and that's, that's where a lot of colleagues balk. For me, this is my teaching load that semester one five credit class. Students will take a couple of these with some public service requirements and some, some professionalism requirements. What this dip does, and the biggest knock on this, is the dreaded C word, coverage. Hey, it's become my pornography, coverage. <laughs> because my colleagues say, but what about coverage? And, and it's a legitimate concern. But if we're going to have coverage, they're going to be in law school for 10 years. And if you look at what was taught in the 70s when I came out, what was available versus now, I shouldn't have been going to law school for three years, probably about a year and a half based on the law out there. So it, it's a legitimate issue. Now, what I try to do is uh, for those who haven't had securities regulation, some have, but some haven't, I got to give them a down and dirty on securities rec. I, I got to give them two weeks as if I'm going over to Germany and trying to explain to Germans what we do. And that's kind of what it's like talking, you know, <laughs> what's this stuff? But so there are compromises, there are trade offs. But I believe that um, it's my own personal opinion that they're worth it. Uh, but it does it does take me, for example, out of other courses, and it probably does limit uh, the number of courses that students can take. And it means they have to really place a premium on planning that second year. Now, there's some talk at our school about opening up, you can take one course. So sort of a safety valve, maybe take one course, a two credit course in each semester just to give a little coverage. But is that responsive? Uh, my other question was about your scholarship. Uh, does it cut into the time of your working on your scholarship? Okay, so well, a follow-up question about my scholarship and not affects the time for that. Well, uh, I don't think so, because this work is what I would call lumpy. There, there's, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't come down the assembly line in smooth fashion the way given lectures does, you know, three hours a week or whatever. It's, it's more like a batch. We've got a lot of work for a while and then less work. A lot of work left. So uh, it means I have to regulate my schedule week by week because I can't plan on the same week for 14 weeks. But it certainly gives me a lot of free time to do my scholarship. Jeff Lipshaw, Southern University. <laughs> Thank you so much. Your question. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm curious how you, how you work this in because we've talked about um, transactional skills and drafting. <coughs> it's occurred to me that, that at least in the meetings or in the groups that I've been in, we haven't talked about drafting as it really is, which is it's not writing. It's going to an old closing book or an old form, or you're sophisticated buying the Jack Levin buyer's version of, of an agreement. Um, and oftentimes it's a process, and I suspect Lyman has some views on this, it's a process of looking at something that was written and trying to figure out if it fits your deal. 
that when you're a young lawyer, you're looking at a provision and have no clue why this particular paragraph is in, and even worse, what it is you might do to change it. Um, that there might be market, so to speak, on a particular provision. How in your courses do you address that kind of, if you do, how do you address that kind of thing? Okay, so to try and boil that down so I don't have to repeat the whole question, the question relates to, uh, I'm going to put it in my own words, the use of precedent transaction documents to um, uh, to divine uh, a properly crafted provision in a certain deal and how our courses address that. And the problems that poses to a young lawyer. And the problems that poses to a young lawyer without requisite knowledge to make those decisions. So, I, I, I do have that in my course. In fact, to identify the issues, I ask in my request for proposals for the students to identify five precedent transaction documents. Actually, they're supposed to identify three in the proposal. I tell them they have to identify five. And they have to compare and contrast those different provisions. And then, I failed to mention one of my pedagogical techniques is having in-office meetings that they are required to come to as well. So I added that to my slide while I was talking. Um, but they come to my office, we talk through those decisions so that if, if they were a junior lawyer in a firm and they were handed a bunch of precedent transaction documents by a senior person in the firm, that's the kind of thing that would happen. They'd say, use the XYZ deal and the ABC deal and the EFG deal and, uh, and draft this, you know, whatever it is, component piece of document, you know, draft a rider that does this. And they look at them and they say, oh my gosh, those deals all have different provisions in them. You know, some of the stuff is the same. I can see what the core values are, but there are obviously a lot of decisions here. I'm ill-equipped to make them. So you then go to a more senior person. Maybe not that same senior person. I actually tell my students, you want to look smart, you find somebody else who's done a deal recently like that, and then you crack the provision and hand it back to senior person number one, having gotten the advice of senior person number two. So you look very smart in front of senior person number one. Um, so that's one way in which they're using precedent transaction documents, obviously, and they're going to draft, they're then going to choose the best model and alter it based on those conversations with me. And I might refer them to an article. In fact, I have referred them to an article co-authored by Mike Warnoff when it comes to anti-dilution provisions. Um, if they're trying to make a choice as to you know, what kind of anti-dilution provision they're going to put in, uh, he's written a great article on it. So among the things I give them is this is article to go look at, and I say, then we can have an educated meeting. Why don't you read this, and we'll see me, and we'll talk through the issues, you know? Because uh, my time is limited, you know? I'm a senior partner, I don't have a lot of time. So that's one way in which I use that kind of exercise for my course. Do you do, you do that in business planning, something similar to that? Yeah, I mean, I do think, Jeff, you know, there's some value in uh, not giving them a good document right away. I mean, probably you should. But I, I give them a document, you can see in the assignment, from another state for, I can't remember if it's manager, manager, or member, manager, but something a little bit off. So it's a little bit of a clinker because I want them to look at something and, and learn to say, well, that doesn't really work. Because I always have thought it's easier for students to react to writing than to create their own writing. I mean, we're all better editors than we are you know, original writers. So, I try to get it at that way. If, if they're just simply fumbling around, then I, I agree with Joan that I better provide some guidance. But I do tell them, don't put anything in that agreement that you don't know why it's in there, because I'm going to ask you. If you've got the Skadden Arps 703B special allocation of tax losses language that goes for four pages, I ask you what the third paragraph means. You better be able to sit there in the office and tell me why that's in there. So suddenly that does get a lot of the fluff out of there. <laughs> so, so I um, I have a confidentiality agreement assignment that I, I I wrote about two page facts for each side. They have different facts and some of them are inconsistent given to each side. And I say um, I tell the same thing. I say go get five precedent. And um, and uh, the first year I, I give that in the first year and and uh, half the kids came back with legal cases, because they thought precedent was legal case. <laughs> and so I went, uh, I, I can't remember, I think it's, uh, I think Ken Adams wrote an article on, um, on precedent that's about two or three pages long. And so I give that out now. And, it, and it's a great article because it goes through what are the purposes, know what you're doing, know what you're, and, and I give them that. And, uh, and it's, it's been remarkable how much that, that has helped. But. Yes, and I'm Mary Trevor from Hamlin Law School. Mary Trevor I'm from Hamlin. Curious about the extent to which some of you have talked about group work 
and encouraging students to group together. I'm curious about the dynamics, observations that, that you have about those in two areas in particular. How do you determine the composition of the groups? Have you let the students determine that? And as the students work in the groups, to the extent that you run across problems such as what Lyman referred to as one person running the show or someone who's just there along for the ride, um, how do you deal with that? Do you have suggestions for that kind of thing? Yeah, it's something I, I struggle with still. Uh, because I tend to know the students pretty well, uh, I assign them. Uh, I, I, I try to max, you know, match them up in ways that I think will work. I will say this, one time about 10 years ago, a colleague told me that I should pit the best students in any negotiation against the other best students because he said, you know, to spread the talent around it's not fair. I, I tried that once. It, it was great, but I, I, I don't think I'm out. So I try to spread talent and personality. Things. It's really hard for me to monitor what's going on. You know, the, the free rider control freak dynamic, um, you know, I tell the free riders, or those who I think might be, you know, the control freak is happy to have you free ride. That's, you know, that's, that's the, the nature of it. The other dynamic is the person that wants to start yesterday versus the one that says, I work best under pressure. And I said, you know, the person that works best under pressure, the fact that you want to start yesterday, that doesn't bother them. But they're driving you nuts, aren't they? You, know, you want them to start yesterday, and they're just thinking, hey, we've got plenty of it. So realize that some matchups are going to aggravate you. Now, I figure some of that's just that's life. So the hardest problem for me is how do I really get at who did what? The in-office meetings helps me a little bit because if somebody just does not seem engaged, I wonder, are you pulling your way? I have gone to voluntary, not mandatory, peer assessment. But Dudley now is a very gentlemanly civic culture, and they don't want to <coughs> talk trash about each other. So I'm thinking about going to mandatory peer review. But I continue to struggle with that. Mike, your view on group exercises, do you use them? Uh, well, I, the confidentiality agreement is group exercises. Mm -hmm. I, I look in the class to see which students get along the least mm -hmm. and put them together. <laughs> just because it's the most enjoyable to watch it happen. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Um, in, in, in my course, I assume that the entire I, I ran, I ran, I ran. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, I, uh, I uh, in this class, use two different types of group exercises, and I, I do that consciously so that I can mix it up a little. In the teaching group exercise, which is two, and if we have an odd number, three students working together, um, uh, I actually allow them to choose their own partners. And when we have the meeting, I give them a framework of about 10 questions uh, that I want to make sure that they cover. They have to meet four requirements for that piece of the course. One is that they have to cover the material, so I give them coverage questions. Uh, and they, it's, it's all based on the syllabus that's gone out. Uh, but then they come and meet with me, usually um, uh, synchronously, you know, in my office about that. Or we, if we can't find a good time, we do it asynchronously and they just meet with each other. Uh, they also uh, have to divine some drafting issue. Uh, and teach the drafting issue since it's a planning and drafting course. Uh, they have to meet a spe specific time limit in what they're doing, uh, and they have to engage the remainder of the class. Because I think we've all seen uh, expert exercises where only the experts do the reading and the rest of the class sits there passively and watches them teach. That's not the point of this class. So uh, they have an engagement uh, piece of the exercise. So those are the, those are the four component pieces. Um, I asked them in my meeting with them whether they want to be graded together or whether they want to be graded separately. Uh, some of the material just gets split substantively down the middle and they do sort of a tag team approach. But some groups have done, I give them a lot of flexibility, uh, things where they do interactive quizzes um, or where they do, in one case, uh, a student read a poem as part of his exercise that he'd written about Sarbanes-Oxley and <laughs> ethics. You know? um, and I told him to get it published. He ended up you know, in, uh, in North Carolina. I don't know if he ever did. But, um, but uh, that was part of it to sort of introduce the subject matter. So uh, they get the choice as to whether they rise and fall together on that project. That's, that's pretty rare in, in my pedagogy. Um, the in-class drafting exercise, I choose the teams. It's graded as part of their participation project. And they're allowed to sort of choose their own spokespersons for different areas in drafting that debt redemption notice. 
But I've also used peer review in another class. I don't use it actually in the corporate finance class. Uh, and I do have a template sheet that they have to, to file uh, with me. I've, I've done it in several different ways, but if you're curious, it's for another transaction simulation class. I can just send you those. But one of them is sort of like, you know, what, uh, what, what did you undertake in this project? You know, what did the other person undertake in this project? What do you think was the strength of the project and the weakness? And you start to match. So it's not really direct dissing of other students. And in fact, with my review project in the corporate finance class, which is not a group exercise, I had one student once question me, we're doing this non-anonymously, you know, why are you asking me to discount the work of one of my colleagues? I said, I'm not, I'm asking you to simply <coughs> review it and critique it, and there's a big difference. And P.S., it's non-anonymous in real life, so, you know, start getting used to it. And most people are, are, you know, third year students that take this class, but there are some second years, and they're still into the I don't, you know, I don't want anyone to have to a bias in judging my work. Um, but I do back that up with, uh, with rigorous grading sheets. So if a student has a question as to why I came to the grade, those grading sheets that are matched to the assignment evaluations that I told them I'm going to uh, are what I give them. And we can argue about whether I've applied them, you know, fairly or not. But then it's within ranges. So. Another thing, I would say I've changed groups. I, they, they're not in the same group throughout. And, and when I give feedback, I do not give them a grade. I give them only uh, comments and then sort of an overall. But I want to get them away from the grade fascination. Now, they sort of try to figure out what does fair mean. <laughs> <laughs> Is that like a C plus? Or I tell them, you know, it's excellent, very good, good, right on down. None of you are excellent, so don't plan on that. But, but mainly it's, it's substantive comments with sort of an overall evaluation, just to wean them away from that. Better. Other questions? Sure. Yes, Bill. Bill Carney, Henry. Uh, I teach six or five students in corporate finance, which sort of rules out some of the techniques that you've been using. Do any of you have any experience in transferring those techniques to the larger classes? Um, Bill Carney, Emory, uh, teaches a large corporate finance section. Do we have any advice to him uh, in using some of this stuff in that context? Um, uh, yes, I've actually had to translate. I do writing in all of my courses, so it's not as, as crazy as this is. As you can imagine, even with 20 students, this is a lot of work uh, to do what I do in this course. But I have had the opportunity to translate my writing exercises for business associations and for uh, securities regulation to larger groups. Um, part of what I do to preserve my own sanity is I limit the length of those projects. So for example, in my, um, in my business associations class, I give them an exercise that's not really a corporate finance planning and drafting exercise, but it'll give you an idea. I ask them to look at a specific form of entity after we've covered all the basics of the different forms of entity and with a specific fact pattern that I give them that's a memo from an absent senior partner uh, to give me two or three, depending on the year, aspects of that particular form of entity that the client wants to form that, um, that uh, are in fact uh, useful to that client on those facts and one that is not. Um, so that they can start balancing the different attributes of the form of entity. But I keep that to, I make them write a memo of one page or less, and I give them margin and font requirements because I figured out in my first couple years of teaching that they would cheat on all those. You know, I had things running all the way to the outsides of the page. So I want to teach them editing too, which is useful for me and for them in the exercise. And in securities regulation, I actually do give them a corporate finance drafting assignment. I make them draft a piece of a prospectus. It's varied from year to year. I give them different uh, fact patterns, but they have to use Regulation SK. They have to look at the broader area of the law and the form and figure out what they need to put in precedent transaction documents and figure out what to put in that section. There, I actually give them the precedent transaction documents. I give them other sections doing the same kind of thing for different types of issuers, so it's a closed universe assignment. So my work is you know, putting together that packet that they have to get to do it. And again, it's a, a brief cover memorandum, no more than a page, and then usually just a small provision in drafting as opposed to the longer ones in corporate finance. Um, in, in business associations, we cap it at 72, uh, which is still small by some school standards for that course. So uh, twice in the semester, I do 72 student brief writing assignments. I do give them generalized comments as well as some specific ones on their own work product. 
uh, and then I also do a final exam. And I do the same thing in securities regulation where I have a very small population. It's never been more than 22. They don't, they don't want to sit with me all semester to talk about in-depth securities regulation. So maybe that gives you some ideas to look at. I haven't done it with 65, Bill. I've done it with 40, 45 in SEC Reg, and I, I do things like that a little bit longer. Teresa Maynard at LA Loyola teaches like 100 students, and she's got some wonderful techniques, so uh, she would be a resource. Any, any of you that teaches in classes with large number enrollments, Teresa Maynard at LA Loyola has really mastered this, so I, I definitely suggest talking to her, because she's doing really cut it down. Any other questions from the Yes, in the back. Uh, Mark Osbeck from Michigan. It's a real basic question from Michael. This is one of your research interests. Uh, what one piece of advice would you give future transactional uh, buyers as well as students? Down on my article. I'm trying to. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, the question was what piece of advice would I give future transaction lawyers? So I, I, wrote, I wrote an article which I'm, about, I'm just about to update. Um, and, and so if you wait about a week, um, uh, I'm going to post an update. But I, um, so I'm a big believer in, in, uh, in law schools teach, it should, it, it's comparative advantage, right? So law schools should teach what they teach best. I think that's substantive law. I think you should have transactional courses in, in second and third year, and I think all this stuff, I teach a transactional course. I think that if you ask me what is, the, when I'm interviewing students, the thing that drives me crazy, it, it, it drives me, is that they haven't had securities, they haven't had administrative law, they haven't had accounting, yet that, you know, they'll have tons of, they'll have tons of cor courses taught by adjuncts, which, I mean, like anything else, uneven quality, but, but the truth is, Law professors who do it full time are better at it than most adjuncts. It's just true, and so there's very uneven quality, uh, and uh, and they're learning things that I really, you know, opinion, someone talking about opinion letters in the in the last, thing. and I think it's great, and I think if you can do it in the context of a course that you're doing, I think it's great. But would I rather have someone have taken securities, which I can't teach? When I graduated law school, you could learn securities on the job. It's not possible. It's not. And, and so I, my advice is take as many transactional substantive courses as are available at your school. I, I don't think you should not take these other things, but I think there's lots of other courses that people take. Art law, water law, and you know, everybody in LA takes entertainment law. Nobody goes and practices it. It's insane. So that, that, that's all right. Yeah, and, and actually, to your point, I mean, because I have so few people who are willing to sit through, like, the gun jumping rules for six hours or eight hours or 12 hours or whatever we're now spending on them because they're so crazy and complicated, um, uh, I do do a lot of securities regulation and business associations, even though it's a four credit hour, one class, one semester class, and I do have to teach securities regulation in corporate finance because not every student has had it. Right, business. but when you put that into VA, yeah. I mean, think about what's in VA now, right? Yeah. You have corporations yeah. and LLCs yeah. and partnerships and agency. Yep. And but you've spoken, right, Bill? You've spoken on this at, at the ALS meeting, right? Where were you the one who said, right, about how, how yeah. you know, yes. there's, you just don't have enough time. And you got CSR and all this stuff, you just don't have enough time. And so I, I would take as much as, as you could, and I don't think, Right, we agree on that part, right? <laughs> I, I believe that we must graduate students with strong doctrinal backgrounds and with skills. I agree. And part of Emory's curriculum for our transactional certificate is at least half of it, more than half of it, is doctrinal. Right, and you make people, actually, when they, when they put up the thing on the slides this morning, you make people take securities. Yeah. If, if you look at most yes. of the certificate Actually, what, we, we don't make them take securities. What they do is, they all have to come see me. Yeah. And I say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And then I say, you have to take securities. Right. Security is not required, but they all take securities. Right, but if you look at most other programs, if, like in UCLA, it's all, you could basically do it by taking adjunct courses. I mean, it's crazy. And for our certificate program, I go in and argue for securities regulation every year, gotta say. You know, because we graduate, uh, you know, up to 30 students a year in our concentration program, 
and some of them have not taken a full semester course in securities regulation. I think that's scandalous. If you're going to work, excuse me, <laughs> um, but if you're going to work with a business, you need to have it. I took, what, two semesters with Helen Scott of securities regulation <coughs> in the audience. Um, and, uh, and it's gotten broader. I mean, the regulation's gotten broader and deeper now. So uh, I don't know how you cover it uh, in, in a bunch of other courses, even if they are all required courses for something like business concentration. So um, not disagreeing with you. Bill. I always right. tell students that going out and giving your client a stock certificate book is like giving them a loaded gun. You really have to you know, understand what you're doing and monitor what they're doing to protect them. Thank you so much. And in fact, I tell all of my students in business associations class, if every time you form a business association of any kind, you are not thinking about whether or not the interests that people are buying are securities, I don't care if you are setting up a merger site. And I might have some disagreement from that in the crowd, right? I want you to know what exemption you're relying on if you are not registering that 100 shares at some nominal, you know, probably par value that you're issuing to the parent corporation so that you can do a triangular merger. You've got to think about it. And if you don't, you've missed the boat. That's to Lyman's point, I think, a lot of the stuff that we're teaching in these kinds of courses is not necessarily something where you're going to spend a lot of time writing about it or thinking about it in real life. But if you haven't gone through the mental exercise, if you don't teach students at the outset, to go through that rigorous analysis, then they're going to make mistakes in practice because they're going to shortcut the reasoning, even when they've had a lot of experience. I totally agree. With you. I tell them, Bill, it's not a crime or a gift; it's presumptively a security <laughs> There you are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it may also be a security You're more than 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 I am. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one more question. If someone has one. <coughs> Okay, uh, thank you.